You kind of stole my thunder. In 1709, playwright and critic John Dennis devised a machine to recreate the sound of thunder for his unsuccessful play Appius and Virginia. A few days later, he went to see a performance of Macbeth at the same theatre and discovered that his device was being used. Angered by the incident, he proclaimed, they steal my thunder, which is where the expression comes from. I say, let's bury the hatchet! The Iroquois people of North America were comprised of five different Native American groups and would perform a ceremony in which the chief of the tribes would literally bury their war axes or other weapons in the ground as a symbol of peace between the different fractions. Hence the phrase, bury the hatchet. In 1837, the Marquis of Watford, who was famous for his mischievous ways and drunken antics, went on a raucous night out with his friends in the English town of Melton Mowbray. The chaotic evening ended with them vandalising various houses and gardens, as well as painting a toll gate and several homes and a statue with red paint. Hence the phrase, paint the town red. When sailors were on the high seas and storms would cause the wind and the waves to become too rough to be on deck, they would go below deck to ride out the storm in the cabin. The retreat would be called going under the weather. If a sailor was taken sick from the storms, they would be sent below deck to stop them from getting sicker and they were said to be under the weather. Another theory for the origin of the term is that it comes from an older expression, under the weather bow. The weather bow being the side of a ship that the strongest winds and rains were blowing from. Sailors would be sent to that side of the ship to hide from the storm. In the 17th century, French hat makers used mercury for their felt. Over a long exposure to the mercury, the material would begin to poison the hatters, which would give them tremors as well as making them act in bizarre and irritable ways. Hence the phrase, mad as a hatter. The hatters wouldn't discover what the cause of their insanity was until 1941. During the Middle Ages, after a hunt, the Lord of a Manor would traditionally hold a banquet. Along with the wealthiest and the highest status diners, the Lord of the Manor would eat the finest cuts of meat. However, the lowest status diners would eat a pie filled with the animal's innards, entrails, and less desirable cuts of meat. The pie was called humble pie. The word humble came from the French word numble, which meant deer innards. It was considered a humiliation to receive humble pie, as it would inform the other guests of your lower standing. At some point, a play on words occurred, and humble pie became humble pie, as humble pie was eaten by the more humble members of the feast. However, the word humble and humble are etymologically unrelated. In medieval England, there were strict laws relating to the price of bread. Any baker found to be overcharging customers for undersized loaves would receive a strict punishment, such as heavy fines or flogging. To avoid such punishment, bakers would always make sure to add an extra loaf when selling a dozen, which is the reason that a baker's dozen means 13. At the drop of a hat, meaning immediately without delay, originates from the 19th century, when it was common to signal the beginning of a race by the dropping of a hat. During that time period, the dropping of a hat was eventually replaced with a gunshot. If an athlete was to start the race before the gunshot, they would be said to have jumped the gun. The ancient Greeks had a variety of methods to hold democratic votes, including voting with pebbles, conducting ballots with olive leaves, or using a show of hands, or performing a roll call. However, to vote for public officials, the Greeks would use a voting system using a selection of white or black beans. The beans would be held in a piece of equipment that, if knocked over, would reveal the state of the vote before the beans were counted, which is a possible reason that the phrase spill the beans means to reveal secret information unintentionally. One of the best indicators to identify the age of a horse is to examine the horse's teeth. The longer the tooth, the older the horse. Instead of listening to the person selling the horse, savvy horse buyers would go straight to the horse's mouth to look at the teeth. This is where the expression comes from. If one was to receive a horse as a gift, it would be deemed rude to go to the mouth and check the teeth. Hence the phrase, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. I don't know. Alright, if you say so. I tell you, it's so hard to remember boring stuff like that. The Hantu Bellion is a tiger spirit and a deity in the indigenous Filipino folk religions or the Malay or Indonesian traditional folklore. According to Malay mythology, the Hantu Bellion is responsible for an involuntary behaviour in which the spirit possesses a person to behave extremely violently to others and to furiously charge and attack people. This action within the Malay language is called Mengamok, and in 1770, Captain Cook was the first Western outsider to record this behaviour, which was called running amok, which is where the phrase to run amok comes from. It is believed that before the invention of anesthesia, if a soldier was injured during battle and had to have a surgical procedure, they were given a bullet to bite down on to help them cope with the pain. Hence the phrase, bite the bullet. The phrase was first recorded by Rudyard Kipling, the author of The Jungle Book, in his 1891 novel, The Light That Failed. In the Hellenistic period, laurel leaves were associated with Apollo, the god of music, prophecy, and poetry. The association came from a story of Apollo saving a river nymph named Daphne and transforming her into a laurel. Apollo was often depicted with crowns of laurel leaves, and because of these depictions, the plant would eventually become a symbol of achievement. 
Athletes who became victorious at the ancient Pythian Games received wreaths made of laurel branches, and this practice would later be adopted by the Romans and given to generals who had won important battles. High achievers within Roman or Greek culture, or laureates, were able to bask in the glory of their past achievements, or rest on their laurels. It wasn't until much later that the phrase had negative connotations, and in the 19th century it came to mean someone who was making no further effort and instead is satisfied with what they have already achieved.